Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be with you this morning. Uh, so glad that you are here to join us for worship today and so excited that we get an opportunity for us to gather together to worship and to be in the church together. What a joy it is. A couple of things that I want to just chat about as we get rolling for the day. First of all, those of you that are joining us online, thank you so much for joining us. We're glad that you are here and uh, we're glad that you are, uh, are watching us and uh, part of the church, even in the digital world. A couple of things we want to share with you. Reminder that uh, if you would like to, uh, to tithe or give your gifts and offerings to the church, you can do it in a couple of different ways on our website. Uh, you can do that at uh, lhwc.net. You can also uh, give to the box, or not give to the box, you can place your gift in the box, which is right behind the sanctuary, or you can mail them in. Um, we kind of live in a different world where the, uh, the typical passing of the plate is not happening as often as it used to, and we're uh, just continuing on with this trend, and so it's working out really well for us. I want to remind you that uh, we have digital connection cards available for you on our website. You can find them lhwc.net. Um, if you are uh, new with us today, we would love for you to fill that out, whether you're in, uh, in person or online, that would be great. Next Sunday, we are having an opportunity for everyone to join us for a picnic that is a connection between us and Hillside Wesleyan Church. And we're doing that at ne next Sunday. It's two Sunday. No, it is next Sunday. I got a little carried away there. Uh, next Sunday, uh, right after church at 12 o'clock, we're going to be meeting at the park in Hiawatha, Guthridge Park, at a pavilion. And we're going to be having lunch together. Uh, there's a lot of things that are going to be provided, but we also need help with uh, providing salads and side dishes. And we have a sign-up sheet that's available on our Facebook page. If you have any questions about the sign-ups, you can contact Sherry Plow today, and uh, you can get all the info of what's going on. But it's an opportunity for our two churches to get together. We're from the same tribe, the same group, the Wesleyan Church, and it's time for us to work together. And this is just a uh, beginning, a get-to-know-each-other type of event, and it's going to be great. And uh, right now, they are in a pastoral transition, which is exciting because they are receiving a new pastor in the coming months, and it's going to be really good for them. And so it's exciting. Uh, God is really doing some great things, uh, not only in our church, but in theirs as well. Two Sundays from now, two Saturdays from now is uh, September 18th, and we're going to be having a men's breakfast. And uh, that's going to be a kickoff for our men's ministry for this fall. And we're going to enjoy some breakfast together. And so we'd love it if all guys would join us for that. Uh, the details are on the screen behind me, but we're also going to be putting that information out on our website as well. It's already on Facebook. If you have any questions about that, Sandy Pumphrey is the guy to chat with. You can't see him in the sanctuary right now because he's sitting in the back uh, helping us out with PowerPoint. So uh, catch him afterwards for any questions that you might have about that. I uh, also wanted to just uh, let you know that we have a number of things that are going to be get, getting started in the coming weeks. Um, we have some really exciting stuff that's happening. Some small groups that are going to be taking place in the coming weeks. Adult small groups, uh, Bible studies. We also have a youth small group that is being put together on uh, Sunday evenings, and that's going to be happening here at the church. We have a table right behind the sanctuary that lists... Uh, that list that has information about our adult small groups, about our youth ministry and the activities that they have going on this fall, uh, a parent form that they would that the youth leaders would love for you to fill out. And then also uh, some next gen ministry information as well. What the schedule is going to be for our kids ministries, youth ministries and everything along those lines. All this stuff is getting ready to happen in the next couple of weeks. So be ready we're going to be flooding uh, your Facebook feed with a lot of information from the church, and it's just going to be really exciting, and I want you to be pumped about it as well. So uh, a lot of stuff going on, and one thing that we are talking about as well is in the couple of weeks, once we get everything situated and put together, we're going to be having what is called Steeps and Sweets. 
And what that is, is from 9.15 to 9.45, you can uh, come into the church early and you can have a nice warm beverage, coffee or tea or something along those lines, and a light snack and enjoy some community together. Uh, the worship team will still be doing their thing here in the sanctuary, practicing and getting ready for the morning. So back in the hallway where we have some tables and chairs and uh, things like that, you can do that from 9.15 to 9.45. Um, but there's things that we have to do to get ready for that. We have a new coffee pot that we're getting ready to uh, get moving, and it's, it's exciting stuff. So um, I hope that you will mark that on your calendar. We will be a little bit more detailed when we have the exact date when we're going to get ready to go. So uh, be thinking about that as we are uh, moving in the next couple of weeks. A lot of stuff going on. And uh, if you missed last Sunday, the fifth Sunday lunch, I'm sorry, we don't have any leftovers for you. Uh, they, they actually, we gave out all the food and uh, the only thing that was left was uh, some cookies and there, I saw that they were still there. You don't want to eat them. They're, they're old. But anyways, uh, it's, been a, uh, it, it's been a roller coaster of a year and a half for us. And for us to be able to do some things that are normal is really exciting. Um, we often talk and wonder, will things ever get back to normal? I don't know. What I know is, is that right now where we're at, that's about as normal as we're going to get because it's life right now. So let's keep on uh, pushing through. Let's keep on pursuing Christ and let's do what matters most. And that is follow after him. Let's take a moment and uh, we'll pray and ask God's blessing upon our time together today and just seek him as we read God's word and hear, hear what he wants to speak to us. Father God, we are so very grateful for who you are and what you do in our lives. Lord, we desire to be a church that reaches our community, to be a church that cares for one another and to be a church that pursues you uh, first and foremost. And Lord, we want to be healthy. And so along with that, we want to hear your word spoken to us. And so speak, God. Fill us with your presence today. And for those that are, uh, are hurting today, God, will you just hold them in your righteous right hand? For those that have had a difficult week with uh, diagnosis or with uh, just the struggle of life, Lord, will you hold them and just be the Lord of their life. For those that heard difficult news, maybe the passing of a loved one, maybe the, uh, the hurt that comes along with just life, God, will you remind them that you are present? You are with us in our greatest storms. You are with us in our greatest joys. And so, God, we just ask that you would work. As we look at your word today, God, will you speak clearly into our lives challenge us take us from the point that we are in right now and move us forward in growth and pursuit of you we love you and we pray all these things in jesus name amen, amen. so if you have your bibles open up to matthew chapter 14 verse 22 and following we've got a good sized passage of scripture uh, to tackle today. We also uh, have this information on your Bible app. You can uh, pull up the Bible app, go to the uh, like the three or four lines on the right side of your uh, of your phone and hit that and then go to events and you can find Living Hope Wesleyan Church as an event on there and you can kind of follow along with where we're at uh, for today. So Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 and third to 33. Hopefully this is a uh, story that you're familiar with. And I hope to accomplish that, uh, that maybe the familiarity, uh, we can dig a little bit deeper, even though it's a familiar story. So here we go. Uh, Matthew 14, 22. Immediately after this, Jesus made his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he spent sent the people home. Afterward, he went up to the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to them walking on the water. 
When the disciples saw him, they screamed in terror, thinking he was a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. It's all right, he said. I'm here. Don't be afraid. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you by walking on the water. Verse 29. All right, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he looked around at the high waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Instantly, Jesus reached out his hand and grabbed him. You don't have much faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. Now, once we got into it, you probably thought, okay, I know this story. It's familiar. I get it. And what, a couple of questions that I want to ask you is this. Is, is this story, is this Jesus or Peter being him, his impulsive self? Or is he up to something else? Peter's simple request or simple question is, is this, if, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And we could easily chalk this up to another example of Peter and his impulsive, impulsivity. That's a tough word. Say that like three or four times really, really fast. Uh, it was a moment of Peter's impulsive nature. If it was, do you think that he would have been rebuked? Because there are two other examples in, uh, in Matthew's gospel where Peter is rebuked because of his impulsiveness. Over in Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 23, Peter is rebuked for telling Jesus that he can't be killed. You can't die. And Jesus tells him, get behind me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing merely from a human point of view, not from God's. That's a rebuke from Jesus to Peter because he really puts his foot in his mouth. And then in Matthew chapter 17, at the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, Peter blurts out this grand idea to build three shelters for Jesus, uh, and one for Moses and one for Elijah as well. And a voice from heaven, God's voice says, this is my dearly loved son, whom I'm well pleased, listen to him. Rebuke. But in this story, Jesus doesn't rebuke. He just says, come. Get out of that boat. Step into the water. So what do you think? Is this a impulsive nature? Is this another one of those uh, those stories where Peter is putting his foot in his mouth? Or is he doing something different? Peter is doing something that none of the other disciples even dared to do. Take risk. Even when it defies logic. Jesus is walking on the water and Peter's like, I'll do it. I'll jump out there. Many times what we don't look at is and don't take consideration what it took for Peter to get out of the boat. We just lump Peter into the boat of impulsiveness and say, that's just Peter. And I think that it's unfair of us to do this to this guy, to this loved disciple. When Peter heard the words of, yes, come. He did something that you and I have never done before. He took that step out of the boat, landed firmly on the water, and began to walk. Instead of calling him impulsive or, uh, or some other name that we might want to give Peter, can we just call him Peter the Obedient? Peter the obedient, because he's an obedient disciple that has taken a huge risk. From any point of view, we can look at this story and we can say, this is simply amazing. But what if Peter is doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing? What do I mean by that? 
Well, let's look at discipleship in a little bit of a broader context. When a person is a disciple of a rabbi, the disciple has already gone through a process of extreme evaluation. Uh, they become the best of the best. Uh, Ray Vanderlaan is a teacher, historian, kind of an archaeologist guy. Uh, he describes discipleship as, the, as this, the process where a hopeful disciple goes to a rab rabbi and asks if he can be a disciple. And it's at this point where the rabbi begins to ask a series of questions, really trying to understand if the hopeful disciple has what it takes to be his disciple. Really, the process of discipleship is a process of transference. The rabbi believes that the disciple has what it takes for the disciple to look, behave, act, and know what he knows and to be like the, the rabbi. And so the questions become, can you pick up the yoke that I have? The yoke was the study, the education that was the rabbis. And if the disciple was seen as the best of the best and could answer all the questions that the rabbi had for him, then maybe the rabbi would say, yes, come and follow me. That was the discipleship. That was the um, disciple process. It's rudimentary in my explanation, but that's the basics of it. But Jesus did it differently. Jesus did his process of calling of the disciples a bit differently. He went to them. He saw out the disciples of his own accord. He did not wait for them to call on him. And discipleship is the process of learning what your teacher, your rabbi knows. And they followed the teacher, the rabbi Wherever he went, desired to be where he was, desired to do what the rabbi did, and they believed what the rabbi believed. And so they would do anything and everything that the rabbi did. So taking this into consideration, is it any shock, any surprise to you that when Jesus comes walking on the water that Peter asks to be where Jesus is? I don't know if it should shock us, but it does. Because when we look at it from this perspective, we see that Peter is a disciple through and through, and he wants to be where his teacher is. In the process of discipleship, we're all allowed to sit in the boat. But I wonder if we should be willing to step out of it every now and then. In this passage, I wonder what, uh, what Jesus is trying to communicate to the disciples and to us by extension. The text tells us that Jesus came to them by water. Mark 6 56 tells us that Jesus intended to pass them by. So if you look at uh, Mark's version of the story, Jesus meant to walk right by them. John Ortberg in his book, If You Want to Get Out of the Boat, If You Want to Walk on Water, You've Got to Get Out of the Boat, says that uh, has some great insight to this uh, significance of Mark's recording of this encounter. He tells us that um, the, the Greek verb par erkomai means to pass by. And this is a Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's a technical term to refer to theophany, those moments where God made striking and temporary appearances in the earthly realm to select individuals or groups of people for the purpose of communicating a message. Here's what I mean by all of that. God put Moses in the cleft of a rock so Moses could see while the glory of God passes by. God told Elijah to stand on the mountain for the Lord was about to pass by. There's a pattern in these stories. In each case, God has the attention of people through the burning bush or through the wind and fire or the walking on the water, and he's got their attention and he's going to pass 
them by. So when Jesus came to the disciples on the water, intending to pass them by, he was not just doing something cool. He wasn't just saying, look at this, I can walk on water. He's revealing his divine presence and his power to these disciples so that they can see because they know the word of God really, really well. And only God can do such a thing. He alone treads on the sea. And Jesus is communicating to them this. He is God. The other thing we must understand about Jesus is that when he came to them on the water and they became, uh, became terrified, Jesus uses some words that should sound familiar to us. Maybe a translation would read like this, don't be afraid, take courage, I am here. Maybe your translation is a little bit different, but this is one of the, uh, the translations that is so powerful. Take courage, I am here. Did you hear it? The context is, is the, the words, I am. Am. Be of courage, I am here. Do you remember when Jesus or when God is in the burning bush and he's talking to Moses and he's saying that you are to go to my people Israel and free them from slavery? I have seen them, I have heard them. And Moses asks, And who should I say has sent me? And he says, I am. Jesus is using the same words to communicate the same message, I am. Be of good courage, I am here. Do not fear. In the midst of life's storms, who's with you? I am. And the dangerous times of life when we don't know where to turn, who's holding us up? I am. When life is out of control and the waves of life are crashing in on you, the waves of pain, waves of hurt, heartache, who is with you? When no one else is, I am. God, the great I am, and Jesus is signifying to the disciples that it is the great I am that is coming to them on the water. God is coming to them in the midst of their pain and their greatest fears, and God is present with them. He is with them. I am. Take courage. Jesus is revealing himself a theophany. They get to see behind the curtain and see that this is God standing before them in the midst of the sea on a boat, and they are missing it. The other disciples are. And Peter, Peter, the only one who says, if it's you, call to me and tell me to come onto the water, and he does. And they get to call this teacher the great I am. Jesus alone treads on the sea and is in control of the universe. This is who Jesus is, and he is telling them. Jesus is communicating to these disciples, I am who you've been waiting for. I am God. I am the Messiah. I am the one who is going to free you. I am going to reconcile you to myself and to God. This isn't just a story of miracle. This is a story of God's presence among them. This is a story like no other because it applies to us today. So what does, it, what does it apply to us about? A couple of things. Getting out of the boat, even, even when it's illogical, is still important. Being a disciple is about being obedient. 
Discipleship can't, cannot be achieved without being obedient. After all, all the stories that we hear in Scripture, there were 12 disciples, and it was Jesus who went to them, and he told them earlier, come and follow me, and I will make you the fishers of men. From the very beginning, in Jesus' discipleship context, obedience wasn't something to be taken lightly. It was a call from the beginning, follow me be obedient it wasn't something that we just said oh yeah that's good i'll do that once but no it's a constant obedient thing and why is it that when we see peter jump out of the boat that we forget that he was doing what he was commanded to do why do we do that why do we second guess the call to get out of the boat not only in Peter's life, but in our own lives. Why do we hear the call of Jesus and we wonder, is that really to me? Obedience is absolutely important to being a disciple. And so for just a moment, what area of your life is Jesus inviting you to come what area is he inviting you to trust him what area of life is jesus inviting you out of the comfort zone of the boat to take a risk and step onto the water maybe it's trusting him for something you've never done before Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's as simple as saying, you know what? I need to just trust him with my finances. That's not simple. That's a big deal. Maybe it's trusting him with your kids, your grandkids, your family. Maybe it's trusting him with a decision that is coming up. Maybe it's trusting him with a diagnosis. Maybe it's trusting him in the midst of pain, when you want to just pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and keep on trucking. What is your area of obedience you have to walk in today? The problem is, is that there are reasons why we don't want to be obedient. The first reason is the fear of failure. We're afraid of failing. We're afraid of failing, falling flat on our face and into the water. And so it's easier for us to not trust. It's easier for us to not fight the temptation and to give in. It's easier for us to not be devoted. It's easier for us to not care about the life that we're living and just go about it. It's easier to let other things creep into our spiritual lives instead of following with our whole heart. It's easier. It's easier. And failure won't happen. Thomas Edison, or so the story goes, when asked about his failures in making the light bulb, he didn't consider it a failure. He found 2,000 some odd ways to not make a light bulb. I get it. Fear of failure is a very real thing. But this life with Jesus isn't dependent upon you. It's dependent upon God and his spirit that fills you with his presence and calls you up out of the boat to walk on the water. Now, does that mean that the next time you get to a body of water in your bathtub, you're going to take a step and you're going to start walking? Probably not. Probably not. Would be cool. Would be cool, but probably not. But does that mean that the next time that you trust God for a really difficult thing, that he's going to answer? He's a faithful God. Faithful God. The other thing that stops us from really jumping out of the boat 
and walking is the loss of focus. Scripture tells us that when Peter sank, it's because he took his eyes off of Jesus. There are many different things that will distract us. Many things that will cause us to lose focus. In the story, it's the waves and the storm. It's the difficulty that was coming Peter's way. But what would it be for us? What would be those things that would distract us or cause us to lose our focus and therefore sink? Oh, man. Could we list them all? Every single day, there's a distraction. You've experienced about seven on your way here today. Probably. Because you probably rolled out of bed and the first thing right by your nightstand was your little device that said, check me, hurry, please. You got important things on there. No, you don't. Not really. You got distractions from family. You got distractions from, did your car start today? Did, you, did this happen? Did that happen? Distraction, distraction, distraction. We can have distraction after distraction. And let me just help you with it today in saying that distractions hit me too. Work is hard. Life is hard. And distractions hit all the time. Can I encourage you to not guilt yourself over the distractions? So what? You get distracted. Work, forgive yourself, <laughs> pray about it, and keep on moving. And I think that over time, you'll begin to realize that the distractions become less and less. Maybe your job doesn't allow you to have uh, those moments where you just get to... Um, you're, you have so much going on. you got kids that are around you because you're teaching or whatever it is. You just don't have downtime. Awesome. But sometimes our jobs have a lot of downtime because of something else. Distraction will happen. Or maybe it's distraction at home. I don't know. But when we lose our focus is when we begin to dip. So focus hard. Pray a quick prayer. Get back on track. Peter did the best thing possible he could ever do. He called out for Jesus. Help me. What did he say? I got to get to the very beginning. Save me, Lord. Save me, Lord. When's the last time you cried out that way? in the middle of your day. Save me, Lord. Now, Peter, yeah, he's fearing for his life because he's sinking in the water. But we're sinking many times in our spiritual lives by the things that we do, the things that we watch, the things that we see, the words that come out of our mouths, the life that we have around us. We're sinking fast, just like Peter in a different context so what if, what if those moments we realize what's going on and we just cried out, save me, Lord. Maybe you can't do it verbally out loud, but you're like, save me, Lord, in your mind. And you are asking for help. His faithfulness is good and he will rescue you. Amen. Oh, man. This passage of scripture is so important for us. And I think that if we can do one thing with this this week is make the commitment to step. God, when you are calling me to be obedient, I'm going to step. Just step. So as we close today, I'm going to pray for you and uh, the worship team's going to come, and they're going to lead us in our last couple of songs. But I want to just invite you to pray specifically that God would help you to step, that God would help you to be obedient and step out of the boat. Let's pray together. Father God, we know and understand that your hand of mercy is upon us. wherever we're at. 
for many of us today, God, we see this passage of Scripture and we think there is no way we can do what Peter did. He was a different breed. He was more bold than we are. He was this, he was that, he was all of that, and we're not. But God, we have to remember that Peter was just a man. He was a human. And in the midst of it all, God, he knew that he wanted to be with you. And he wanted to be obedient. And so he took a step. And Lord, that's something that we can all do. Help us to get over the, the fear of failure. Help us to not lose our focus. And when we do, to not guilt ourselves when we do lose our focus. But to be consistent and to be obedient. Help us to step. Help us to mentally take the step to trust you with everything. With our pain with our hurt, with our joy, with our lives. Thank you, God, that you are a faithful God. Your love endures forever, as the Psalms say over and over and over again. Your love endures forever, and we get to experience that every day. Thank you, God, for your goodness and your mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. So glad that you're here. Uh, don't forget, uh, next Sunday we have the Hillside and Living Hope uh, picnic at Guthridge Park. And if you have any questions about that, seek Sherry. And we've got a lot of things going on. So I hope that you are willing to check out the table so that you know all the info. And uh, have a great day. We'll see you again next week. Let's stand and we'll worship together.